Welcome to our Good News program. We're so thankful that you've tuned in. We're asking the question each week, are you ready for the rapture? And this is why we have Christ coming in the clouds. And if you're not ready, you are going to be left behind for the awful times that are coming in the book of Revelation. That's why we must teach you these truths. And this is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. This is him coming in the Shekinah glory cloud. This is coming for us. Shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet them in the clouds. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. We're going to meet the Lord in the clouds and he's coming just like you see here. And if you're not ready, then you will not go to be with the Lord. Now he is going to come. This is the next event that is going to happen. That's why we have been studying our inheritance in Christ. And this is why you need to know what you truly are as a child of God and our inheritance in him. So we're going to see in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now we read this to you before, but you need to know this. Verse 30, 1 Corinthians 1.30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Now this is one of the most important things that you can know is that redemption is from God. And we're going to find that out this week. And you are going to see that it's all from him. Absolutely all these inheritance are free. He has left them for us. And then we turn even to Jeremiah chapter 9 and beginning in verse 23. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. You see, all riches come from God. All wisdom comes from God. Christ has been made the wisdom of God unto us. There is no other real wisdom. Now listen at verse 24 of Jeremiah 9. Let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Let's pray. O oh, our gracious and dear Heavenly Father, we truly delight in thee. We thank thee that the joy of the Lord is our strength. We thank thee that we have the peace that passes all understanding. We thank thee for eternal life. We thank thee for prayer in thy name. That we can ask for every person that's listening to know what redemption means. We thank thee for these truths as we study together the truths of thy word. 
And we thank thee and praise thee for hearing and answering our prayers and saving every person that's listening and every person that's a true child of God that they can know while we are studying thy word that we're seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus and that we are edified and built up as a body of believers. Bless this time together. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, one of the greatest things we have been studying is our inheritance in Christ. Now we have seen that Ephesians 1 through 3, we're, they are occupied with what we have come to be and have in Christ. The thing that we understand about the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 1, 3, that we, God's word says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So our inheritance is in him. The first thing that we learned was humility, enforced by his example. We have none of these things apart from salvation. Absolutely none of these. And then we have his love. His love is the fountain of our love. His love works through me to love those around me, and my love toward those around me brings forth fruit. I am to love one another as he has loved me. The heavenly home, his promised heavenly home for us, we're going to meet him in the clouds. We're going to meet him in the air. And we're, he has taken us to this home that he has prepared for us that never cost us anything. It's all free. Everything, eternal life is free and prayer, and the power of his name, and peace that passes all understanding, thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because we trust in thee. Now this is the secret of his priceless possessions. And then we see the abiding life. If you abide in me, and I abide in you, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. And then we have his joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. What he is in us is what we are to have for those around us. Our life, his life, is to be lived through us. And then with a heart yearning to know this unfailing joy, the joy of the Lord. He wants us to have the abundant life. And that's his joy. And then, of course, the gift of the Holy Spirit. We saw that. That this is his children have his abiding presence. The abiding presence of God. And victory, his victory. His victory made ours in deliverance from sin in the life that overcomes. The life that overcomes. Do you know this life? His victory, John 16, 33. John 16, 33. As we study these and know what he has for us and, and live the abundant life and just think about what he has left us before he went back to his father. And now today he's praying night and day for us. John 16, 33. Now, this is his last utterance to his disciples. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. If you live a defeated life, it's not what Christ wants for you. He wants you to have victory because he has left us his victory. These things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In me, that's in him. There is no other peace. And we see the false peace today and everybody's wanting peace, peace, and crime. Peace, peace. There can be no peace in your life apart from Christ, his peace. Here are the last words of our Lord to his own. John 16, 33. After these, he turns to speak to his father and to go to the cross. But he has this further bequest crouched in one confident, cheering word, victory, his victory. I have over, 
overcome the world. This is his victory. He had met the foe in final combat. He proclaims himself the victor and declares us to be the beneficiaries. You see, anyone that wants worldly things and earthly inheritance can never know what his inheritance is because you're going to die and leave an earthly inheritance. When we have his inheritance, we are going to be where he is in perfect peace and righteousness. No more pain, no more sorrow for those who accept Christ. And then, then under the greatest provocation, have you had hatred? Have you had people despise you and reject you? Christ never sinned. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Under the greatest provocation of hatred and injustice, he will go to the cross, the sinless, for the sinful. You see, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But he dies. His, he dies our death, but he rises from the dead, and he is in heaven today preparing a place for us. This is victory for every true believer. So in his last will and testament, in his last will, he makes over to his own, his all-conquering, all-inclusive victory. Now we can shout, thanks be unto God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be unto God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now how can this be that we can only have victory one way? We can only have victory one way, and that is through the cross. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. So how do I know that I have victory? Well, because Christ died for me. He died for me according to the scriptures. He died for me according to the scriptures. And he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He died instead of you. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Hebrews 9.22. He had to die. He had to go to the cross to take the wrath of God's wrath of sin for us. He had to die for us. And what a victory. How greatly indeed that we have this wonderful, wonderful victory. Victory over death and victory over sin. This is amazing. And victory over the world. That's how we can say this. And then we who are tripped up. Now I want to ask if any of these your sins. We who are tripped up by an ugly temper or an ungovernable tongue a tongue that speaks evil of another person, an uncontrollable tongue. He who suffered defeat at the hands of jealousy. Jealousy is a defeat in your life and you're in bondage if you have these sins. An ugly temper, an uncontrollable tongue, envy, do you envy someone or do you have hatred towards someone or ill will? Who are shamed by the sin of passion and evil desires? Who are puffed up with pride and self-conceit? Who profess loudly, only perform poorly? who declare allegiance to Christ, then follow the flag of the world. Are you living like the world? Or do people see Christ in you? Or do you faint when it turns against us? How wonderful to know 
that our overcomer has already covered all these failures with his victory. Are these sins yours? If they are, you can never know the joy of the Lord and the blessings that he has for you. Any of these will keep you from the blessings of God. Only to make it over to us, we, as we abide in him, all of these are ours. Victory. Friend, have you received this bequest? Do you know yourself a victor in Christ? Are you living out his victory and a deliverance from every known sin? That's why we gave you these things that keeps you from victory. Known and recognized and confessed. You see 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then we see, and once again, we see 1 John 5, 4. 1 John 5, 4. And you know, when you know these truths, you want to live a victorious life because you don't want to be defeated. 1 John 5, 4. For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So Christ came all the way from heaven, from heaven's glory, to deliver us. Christ's life was itself one long triumph of victory over the world. And ours is to be the same. The world with its selfishness and greed, he refused it all. We're going to die and leave all these things we're working so hard for. Why aren't we serving the Lord? That is eternal glories. That is eternal rewards for you and for me. It's hatred, the world's hatred. You see, all the world does is hate slander, and persecution, he had met it all with divine patience, meekness, and gentleness. The world gave him the cross. The world is God's enemy. Why do you want to obey what the world says rather than what God says? This is John 12, 31. John 12, verse 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. The world lieth in the wicked one, the devil. That's what the world has to offer you. Absolutely no joy. No joy whatsoever is in this world. They may promise you all good things, but not what God promises you, and his promises are never broken to a trusting child. And we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Here's what Paul says. Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. Meekness and lowliness. That's what the Lord has for us as true believers. And now we're going to go to Ephesians. We have to go to Ephesians because Ephesians 4 shows us that we are to live what this says. The church is called a new man. Ephesians 4 verse 1. When we get into these lessons, here's what he says in Ephesians 4. And we must live this, or this goes along with our inheritance. Ephesians 4, I therefore, brethren, this is, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness, meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the spirit of the unity 
and the bond of peace. So what is this? We ought to walk even as he walked. This is 1 John 2, 6. Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Walking in meekness produces gentleness toward the brethren, the fellow saints. That's what we're to have toward one another. We manifest practically that we are members of one body. That's what our lives are to manifest. Love is to be the governing principle toward all the saints of God. Keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This is endeavoring. This is a delight. This unity can never be destroyed, for it is the work of God. The Spirit of God never divides. The Spirit of God unites. When we keep the unity of the Spirit, we recognize in every true believer, this is a member of the body of Christ. We must constantly feed on the glorious realities of our redemption in Christ. I, therefore, that ties on to what has happened in Ephesians through the first three chapters. Lowliness, what is going to be our conduct? This is what he's telling us here. Lowliness means humility, means to compare yourself side by side with Christ. This is a comparison, a standard that God commands us as believers. This is, when I compare myself with Christ instead of other people, I will never be proud. I will never be proud. This is that our walk will walk side by side with the Word of God. He is the living Word. You will never have ego. You will always desire to do what His Word says. Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. And then meekness. We always ask, what would He do? What would Christ do? Well, meekness, he produce, meekness produces gentleness. Bowing yourself to the will of God. Bowing ourselves. You see, you're never angry at the wrong time. You're under God's control. Long-suffering. The spirit that never admits defeat in the work of the Lord. You see, your ministry is a joy. Are you bearing fruit? Am I glorifying the Lord? Those are three things you must always ask. You won't let discouragement, tribulation, trials, let anything defer you from that goal before you. You don't want to be a castaway. Have patience. Patience is the greatest virtue of a Christian's life. Forbearing one another in love, the spirit of love. The love of Christ is stronger than your feelings and emotions. The love of Christ is stronger. Colossians 3, 13. Colossians 3, for, for, forbearing one another and forgiving one another if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave, so also do you. You see, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. This means that we have a right relationship with everyone around us, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Do you possess these five things? Do you have peace with all those around you? Why do you want all these things? Because the Spirit of God gives us unity. 
one body, and he is the head, and the head does the thinking. The body carries out the decisions that come from the head. You can't have unity in the body of believers unless you have these five basic things that's laid down for us in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. You must have all of these. And now we come to his prayer in John chapter 17. Our Lord has reached the supreme moment and taken leave of his own. He's conscious that his hour has come. He is eagerly facing the prospect of being glorified once again with his Father. But he cannot leave them without one last crowning bequest, his prayer for them. Known as his intercessory prayer or high priestly prayer, it is the epitome and part of his earthly prayer life. But more particularly of that prayer ministry that was to accompany him that he would be occupying in glory. It is the anticipation of his age long, of his age long intercession. Our great high priest. That's why the church has no priest. When he died, he is our great high priest, praying night and day for us. What is the burden of his prayer? Based upon his finished work, it, he, it is concerned with those believing their own that he is going to be leaving them and now he's going to be in glory praying for them. What a prayer John chapter 17 is. He leaves them in the world, but yet no longer of the world. He leaves them in the Father's keeping. He leaves them with the sanctifying power of his word. You see, if you, it's not enough just to go to church. It's not enough. Just We must study this book to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. We must know what he has and the promises. You know, like in Peter 1.5, we're kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. It is a prayer that we be kept in a life of separation, separation from the world, of which we are no longer a part. We're pilgrims and strangers down here. We are no longer a part of this evil world because the world lieth in the wicked one but our lives are to be a glory to God unto him, to whom we now belong, thus to be winning souls to Christ. Are you winning souls to Christ? Are you laying your treasures up in heaven where there is rewards for each of us?